Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Whew, still hot. Alright, um, today we're going to go over... Well, today we're still in History of Horror. We're still finishing up History of Horror. We've gone all the way backward to the beginning of human history, and now we're going forward... We did a general review forward, and now we're going over certain topics I want to talk about going forward. Um, last time we did the, from beginning to current vampires. This time I'm going to do from beginning to current overreacher plot, being uh, the overreacher plot um, as described by Noel Carroll and um, philosophy of Horror, which I don't think I have in front of me at the moment. Oh, well. We know what we're talking about. Guy messes... When man messes with stuff he shouldn't be messing with, you have the overreacher plot. Hmm. I have my bottle of cold iced tea. And I'm almost ready to go. Oh, and the other thing I'm going to be talking about today is... The thing I'm going to be talking about first is the publishing history. Um, from beginning to current. Um, horror fiction, when it is published, and it took a while for it to be published, was rarely published... Except in the most inexpensive way possible. Just like horror movies in the 50s, the horror Z pictures and the B pictures, they just wanted to throw some money that they knew would be profitable. And if you think about the most profitable movies of all time, I'm talking here about horror movies. Paranormal Activity was made for nothing and made billions of dollars. Um, Blair Witch Project made with no money and made billions of dollars. Profitable stuff, horror. And usually it's printed on really, really, really cheap paper or in nowadays e-books um, and makes a lot of people money. Not always the author. author. Not often the author. But makes other people lots of money. Um... So, I actually made some arts, arts and crafts for publishing history. Um, I did. I made up a little uh, chronology um, because as soon as cheap publication became available and wanting to make profits, um, they're actually called chapbooks, um, which is sort of the getting our word cheap from. We're going back a little bit. The word meaning of the words changed a bit. But chat books, they were started way, way back. Um, well, the first Faust book. Um, the first, we're going to be talking about Faust and the Overreacher, of course, because um, he's an Overreacher. And he's usually the first Overreacher. So the first Faust book was done in 1587, and that was done as a chapbook. And chapbooks went further back than that, even. Um, we're talking about the 16th century here. Um, and Dr. Faustus was probably a bit more... Well, that was a, more of a broadside because it was... Uh, because it was a play. But let's let's put up here my my work. <laughs> this is it's sort of am I know it's amateurish, but this is what I was playing around with chat books um so before the eighteen hundreds, the cheapest thing you could get was the chat book um really cheap printing you know not huge book, but cheap to make and cheap to sell. 
usually only a half penny or a penny um, in the old British version. And of course, you know, I have it the this is the maroon color. I have at the top literary magazines, which are going to be coming in to, to being pretty quickly here too. Those are where the big shots are going to be publishing for the most part, um, up until the 50s, a little after the 50s. Um, so that's the, the light, the lighter red. Um, but the rest of these are the cheapest possible things, and usually where, where you'll find horror. So you have chapbooks ending in about the 18, well, until the mid, mid 19th century. So the mid uh, 1850s, and they sort of phased into the Penny Dreadfuls. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Penny Dreadfuls. Um, they sort of Well, as I said, they cost a penny, and they're full of dread. Um, yeah. And there's also the half-penny terrors and stuff like that. Dime, um, in America, dime terrors or um, ten-cent terrors. Something along those lines. Um, dime novels. Um really cheap to make, really sold cheaply, sold to mostly young people, because most of the horror audience is young, always has been, probably always will be. Um, but, you know, the early cheap books, and um, actually it was called Yellowback Paper, um, which makes you think of the yellow pages, which of course are cheaply made. Um, Petty Dreadfuls would be about that sort of thing. Really cheaply made. Of course, the next one coming along is the pulps. Um, the pulps were made out of wood pulp. It was the cheapest leftover wood from other, you know, when they're baking paper, the leftovers were pulp. Um, think of an orange. If you squeeze an orange, what you have left over is pulp. If you made paper out of that, not orange pulp, but pulp from wood products, you'd get really not great paper. And you'd print cheap stuff on it, like, like Conan the Barbarian, or Conan the Sumerian. I keep, yeah. Conan the Sumerian, who's, uh, Robert E. Howard, or Robert E. Howard's horror mo uh, stories, or Robert E. Howard's buddy, H.P. Lovecraft, published in Weird Tales, A Pulp. Um, you know, and of course, this is where horror comics start as well, at the, you know, not also, um, shooting for the kid audience. Also quite inexpensive. Um, the old school horror comics, um, essentially on almost newsprint, um, in the same way that Archie comics are made. You know, it's not the most expensive paper. It's not fancy. Um, and of course, horror comics, as we talked about, got shot down in the mid fifties. Um, Actually, I don't think I think my my lines are wrong on that a little bit, but that's okay. I can't make them perfect. Um, but that's all right. Um, and then, of course, paperbacks became in there. Your your standard mass market paperback, such as this Feast of Fear, Stephen King. I have the mass market of Dance Macabre someplace. Here it is. You're cheap, cheaply made, selling for six bucks nowadays. Go back 30 years, um, 
50 years actually <laughs> since the, at the advent we're not talking about much money at all um, and then you get into the, like you know the Beatles had a song paperback writer about a guy who's just writing cheap paperbacks um, or writing a cheap paperback oh it is hot and then coming into the late 90s early 2000s we had the advent of ebooks which is essentially where it's going a lot of you know write, starting writers and starting horror writers really had to start you know Lovecraft published in the pulps exclusively and he's one of the most influential horror writers ever uh, Penny Dreadfuls were were a lot of the you know the things I'm talking about in the 1800s and whatnot were published in some were published in literary literary magazines Poe actually started a literary magazine and was published in it um, Dickens of course was publishing directly in literary magazines but you know coming in the 70s and you know they were either published in paperbacks or they were published in short stories <laughs> actually if you read these if you get a chance um, bare bones conversations and terror with Stephen King um, I recommended it on the first video I remember and feast of fear conversations with Stephen King both Tim Underworld Tim Underwood and Chuck Miller there's gonna be a lot of interviews with them about oh your new story was in Playboy magazine or your new story was in Penthouse magazine or you're being interviewed by Penthouse and Playboy or skin magazines that are not as well known or well respected as Playboy or Penthouse um, or usually out of business at that point uh, at this point um, I can't remember what it was Do I have a... Is there an index in here? That would be helpful. There's not. Um, I don't think I have it in here. Hmm, maybe in here. Ooh. I am starting to get mold on this book. That's not good at all. It's too damp. Um, yeah, Fang... Ooh, Fangoria... This is Penthouse. <laughs> so, yeah, we're talking about oh, Look at that. That's awful. That's that's mold starting to grow. I shouldn't really touch it. Um I got to take care better care of my books. They've been sitting here on my desk but it's so moist in this room right now you have no idea um, but Stephen King published a lot of his stories in men's magazines men's special interest magazines um, skin skin mags not porn mags but skin mags um, actually some of Robert E. Howard's stuff same thing the ones that didn't get into weird tales he did write sexier stuff so he publish those in those magazines. If you have actually some of these interviews with Stephen King, he talks about in the 70s when this is still going on. Um, you know, literary magazines in general are dying now. Most magazines in now in general are dying now. They're all going you're going to online. Um, he talks about what magazines are looking for, what their lengths are, and stuff like that. Sort of in a help to writer's guide sort of thing. But most literary magazines are where the big shots are being. Um, the Dickens was, in, of course, in literary magazines. Poe was in literary magazines. Ambrose Bierce was in literary magazines. Um, Shirley Jackson would be in literary magazines in the 50s area. There's not a whole lot in the 
between the when pulps die and paperbacks get started and of course we had World War II in that area um, but there's not much except literary magazines Shirley Jackson was publishing in Collier's this was the Saturday Evening Post with Norman Rockwell era um, You know, so Shirley Jackson's short stories would be in Collier's or Harper's or something along those lines. Um, in the uh, Evolution of the Weird Tale, S.T. Joshi, a uh, book I've been reading, it's, it's pretty good too, by the way. Um, he talks about like F. Marion Crawford having uh, working on X magazine, um, X newspaper even. Um, some of his stuff was published in newspapers um, back in the 18s. So we could we could even add another one onto this that newspapers in the 18 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Newspapers were a big chunk of the weird fiction. So, so it's not, you know, this is the this publication history is important to us horror fans because <laughs> horror is usually relegated to the cheapest form of production, and of course you don't get any cheaper than ebook. <laughs> as far as producing goes, the guy just puts it on his site and is downloaded for a price of which the author gets a small chunk <laughs> of course the publisher of course is hosting it and of course if the most if it's a major publisher if you can work your way up to doing paperbacks so paperbacks are still going on um, but it usually takes a couple of successful paperbacks before you get into hardcover area and then you, you know, or quality paperbacks. Um, you're following along. You really have, to, in publishing world, you really have to prove yourself. Stephen King had stuff published in skin magazines. Then he came out with, he sold Carrie, and um, published in paperback. Almost certain. I don't think it was originally a hardcover. Oh, I might want to check that. Come on, Wikipedia. Um. Oh no. Come on, Stephen King. Was it first published? I know what the plot is. Um, I don't think that the first publication of Stephen King's Carrie was in hardcover. I think it was in paperback. Um, Cavalier Magazine is the other thing magazine I was thinking of. Yeah, is a. Uh, It did mention that in in the Stephen King little bit here. Ooh, a nice little picture of a chick on there. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I don't know. I know what it is. Come on now. I don't need to know about the... Uh, first print run of 30,000 copies. First cover edition. 
First cover edition was Double Day. It was in hardcover first. I take it back. But then again, this is Stephen King we're talking about, not some schlub. Um, but a lot of people have to work from, most major authors have to work from paperbacks to, you know, um, quality paperbacks, the oversized size, this size, um, and then on to hardcovers if they're even more successful. Of course, Carrie is Carrie. Carrie is iconic. So, yeah, it doesn't... And uh, the person who published it for him really went to bat for him, as everybody who knows the story knows. Okay, so publishing history, we have a general idea. Um, this is just a, a quick... visual to help you out with that. Now we're going to talk about the overreacher. I have my notes here. Um, the overreacher is going to be one of the first acceptable forms as we've mentioned several times. Back, back, back in the day if you wrote too much about horror, um, horrific stuff, you ran the risk of being accused of being in league with the devil, etc, etc, etc. Faust, the first Faust book, came out in 1587, titled Faust Book. Um, and it was sort of based on a real guy. Um, f f what, what was the original guy's name? The real Dr. Faust? Um, he was an alchemist. I'm looking him up as we speak so I can get his years. Um, Faust. Um, Faustian, yes. Uh, the real... Fifteen eighty seven was the first one. It was based on a fourteenth century Johann Fust, one of actually the business partners of Johann Gutenberg. Um, oh, there we go. Johann George Faust. 1480 to 1540, a magician and alchemist, um, probably from Nittlingen Wurttemberg, who attained a degree in divinity from Heidelberg, yada yada yada. Did you go away? Minimize that one because I want to look at that later. Um, so, 1480 to 1520 or something. And then the guy died. He, he, so when the Faust book was written in 57, the guy was already dead for 40 years. So sort of being based on a real guy, you're not going to get in trouble for being in league with the devil. You're saying, oh, no, that guy was in league with the devil, and he's dead. What are you going to do? So the overreacher is, of course, point of the overreacher is to go beyond what, to mess with things that man was not meant to mess with. Um, there's a bug on my wall and it's annoying me. That's why I keep looking up into that corner. I don't want to smash it. But last time I smashed a bug on camera, the thing closed, so I'm not going to risk it this time. Um, it's gross, though. So, Faust, the first Faust book, it was also published anonymously, which also helps a heck of a lot. 
um, for not being accused of witchcraft. It's like, I don't know who wrote it. Um, it became established because he was saying, hey, you can't. It's not the guy who wrote it. It's the, about, it's the guy who's this magician in the 14, uh, 1400s. And this is the 1500s. The guy's dead. What are you going to do? You could burn him as, as a witch, but he's already dead. So it doesn't make any sense to burn him as a witch. So 1587, Faust book. The first Faust story. About a guy who sells his soul to the devil for knowledge and power. Then you have um, Dr. Faustus. Uh, 1604 by Christopher Marlowe, play based on Faust. Um, Marlowe was one of Shakespeare's contemporaries or around that time. Um, maybe even predecessor a bit. Uh, a very popular play at the time, and of course, what, he's not going to get in trouble because it's based on a previous story that's fairly well known and of course it's still based on a guy who's already been dead for now about 150 years and then about this time the mania for well the 30 years war we're going to be going into more mania in the especially on the continent for burning people um in league with the devil, so you're not out of the woods yet. Um, but Faust is pretty, pretty safe bet. You could tell a Faust story, and Marlowe did. Then you go into the Age of Reason, and of course, most horror stories fall away because all that's left is um, hyperrealism stories. Then comes the uh, Romantic er Age, where people get sick of the Enlightenment. And they say, oh, I don't want the Enlightenment anymore. I want, I want my, you know, ghosts and goblins and whatnot. So Faust makes a return in, by Goethe. Probably the most famous Faust now that we're talking about. Still the same story still based on the whatever it's just getting better um, so Goethe tells his tale pretty much right after that Frankenstein comes out by Shelley now Shelley of course isn't saying a guy makes a deal with the devil and then has realizes he goes to he shouldn't have done that and has to back out of it or find a way out of it Frankenstein is about a guy has too much faith in his own powers and he goes into areas blindly that man was not meant to tread. He overreaches. Obviously, it's the preeminent um, overreacher. So, you know, that's 1818. Uh, this is it. I mean, on this list, I'm usually just doing original um, overreachers. I know there's more that remakes of all these as well, especially in the films. Um, but I'm just talking about original stories. Um, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, um, 1886. Again, a man shouldn't be messing with what he's messing with. He shouldn't be trying to get the best of both worlds. Of course, he's the hypocrite who wants to go to the shows in London um, and be also be seen to be above the shows in London, to be better than that. He wants to be seen not drinking good wine, but he wants to drink good wine. He's a hypocrite. So he creates the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but he shouldn't be messing with this sort of stuff. Man was not meant to. And of course it comes back to bite him. The Golem, um, 1914, Myrink. Um, of course the Golem story is starts way back. 
the story of it starts well, from the time when the the actual rabbi was in Prague, who is supposed to have done it. Fifteen um, hundreds, late fifteen hundreds, or mid fifteen hundreds, um, around there, give or take. Um, rabbi Lo, L O E W, I think was the name. Um, but the Golem by Myrink was the first novelization. Of course, it was made into movies as well. Um, this was 1914. It's not that the... It's still man not messing with stuff he's not supposed to be messing with. Um, a guy playing God, he's putting the name of God in lump of clay, so the lump of clay turns into... Um, becomes animated. Right, so... Excuse me. Uh, I can't. Uh, come on. Uh, I think it might be coming down with a cold too, which wouldn't be cool. Um, there's not so much a boomerang in the golem. The golem doesn't turn. on people so much. It's a different kind of story, but it's still men messing with stuff they're just not supposed to be messing with. And that comes into context a little bit more. Um, Herbert West Reanimator by Lovecraft. It's a update on the Frankenstein. It is essentially Frankenstein remade. And of course this was done again and again and again. Um, but it's Lovecraft, so it's definitely worth a mention. Uh, I actually did listen to these fairly recently, and they're pretty good. Um, kind of racist. You're going to get that in Lovecraft. hate to say otherwise, but it's unfortunately you're going to get it in Lovecraft. But good story. Uh, Donovan, Donovan's Brain, 1942, by Siodmak. Um, Uh, I talked about this a couple of times. The guy takes the brain out of the body and puts it in a vat of chemicals. The brain belonging to Donovan. And starts communicating with it telepathically. And then the brain starts taking over his brain, uh, the scientist's mind and making him do stuff like trying to run over a little girl. Um until he breaks the vat of chemicals. And finally on the list here, um, I have The Stand by King, 1978 or 1990, as I read it. Um, I say if you're going to read it, but only going to read it once, I recommend reading the unabridged version. Because I read it, and I was like, and if I'm going to read it, I'm going to read Go Whole Hog and read it, the full thing. But it was, it's a it's a long book. <laughs> um, I might uh, I might be interested enough, it was a really good book, I might be interested enough to read it unabridged, or sorry, abridged, the original. I might not, I'm not sure. It is a long book even then, but it's 400 more pages or something like that with the unabridged. Captain Trips is the disease in the stand. And it was made in a military base. I don't know how much is actually how much more details in the unabridged than the abridged. This may be in the unab in the abridged version. I can't I'm getting the terms confused in my head or confabulated. Um they might have the information in the abridged version, or it might just be in the unabridged. Um, about the creation of Captain Trips, or it might be mostly in the movie. Um, one of the movie versions, the one I saw with... Uh, Who's the actors? There's a couple of actors. 
Molly Ringwald? No. Maybe. Um. Rob Lowe? I think it was Rob Lowe. Gary Sinise. I'm pretty sure it was Gary Sinise. Anyway, um. I think Stephen King was twice in it as well. Once as a dead scientist in the lab. And once someplace else. I don't remember where. Oh, once as the one of the guys in Denver. Yeah. Anyway, um Captain Trips. Men should be messing with making biological disease weapons. And guess what? It kills the world. Um and that was my novels section. Um, but I forgot uh, a few that I wanted to talk about. Um, Stepford Wives. It's not so much... It doesn't boomerang on the creators of the Stepford Wives, but it's certainly horror. Uh, Ira Levin. The novel was 1972. The film versions were 1975 and 2004. Um, and even Rosemary's Baby, another Ira Levin... Uh, the 1967 book and 1968 film. Um, I do have the film here. Uh, Mia Farrow, of course. The Rosemary, of course, didn't make a deal with the devil. The uh, the old people did. <laughs> the uh, the neighbors. The satanic na um, neighbors. The el elderly satanic neighbors. Right. Um, it didn't really boomerang on them. It boomeranged on Rosemary and the baby. Okay, so also, you now of course, at the advent of movies, the first couple were instantly made into movies. Uh, Frankenstein was made in the movies as early as 1910, with uh, the production company by Thomas Edison, and then of course in the 20s. Um, 1920, the Golem was made into a movie um, in I don't know if it was Germany or pardon me, Eastern Europe but um, Jekyll and Hyde was made into several versions um, up to the 40s and it was the first time a horror movie was won an Academy Award for Best Actor, um, Frederick March, in 1942. Um, had Herbert West is made into a movie, The Reanimator. Um, Donovan's Brain was made into the movie about three times. The Stand is made into a movie and a miniseries. Um, Faust is probably made into a movie too, but I don't remember it. I can't imagine it wasn't made into a movie some version of Faust. Um, but the ones that during the 50s and 40s and 50s, of course King talks about it quite a bit in Dance Macabre. Um, he talks about techno horror. Um, what was it? Actually he talks about it in 153 to 192 in the British version, anyway. Um, yeah, Techno Horror, which is technology running amok. Now, I have the movies here. Techno Horror, Big Bug Movies, and Political Horror, um, which borders on Techno Horror in some cases. Big Bug Movies is, of course, radiation getting into X animal, bringing it up to several stories tall and destroying whatever city um, or terrorizing whatever countryside 
so, but the equator mass experiment was the mad scientist updated, and King talks about the equator mass experiment quite a bit. Um, he calls it the creeping unknown. Um, this is a hammer film. I'm almost positive they're all hammer films. Um, it was a, a television series as well um, in England. A rocket scientist sends a rocket up to space and comes down and um, two of the guys are dead and the other guy's being catatonic and then he starts becoming moldy. Uh, he he's a he's a space becomes space mold. Um, that was 1953. Uh, Godzilla Gojira um, is 1954. Gog um, is also 1954. That's the the robot with pincers. Um, Gog and Magog, who are terrorizing a space colony thing in the future because people trusted in technology and technology betrayed them and goes crazy runs amok um, and then a man with the x-ray eyes a guy puts super special eye drops in his eyes and uh, starts seeing things goes to Vegas and looks through people's cards so he knows what th their hands are and you know looks up g girls skirts and, s and stuff like that and then he starts seeing more and more stuff so it's boomerang it's a true boomerang um, but I had one another one that I forgot to put on there but I thought of earlier it's actually one I mentioned in the o overreacher series in general is Fritz Lang's Metropolis. The guy creates something not caring that it's going to boomerang. He wants it to boomerang. It's designed to boomerang. It's designed to be destruction. Um, this is also sort of the Voldemort thing. He's going beyond what people are supposed to be doing as well. Wizards. Um, but he doesn't care. The Fritz Lang villain doesn't care about the, you know, the destruction. He wants the destruction. Um, that's 1927. So that's Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Um, and then, of course, remakes of the remakes. Um, actually, ending. Most recent good one that I saw was this, um, Subject 2. I did mention this a few times, too. Um, good little Frankenstein story. Guys trying to beat death um, through chemicals and what are the things supposed to be called? Nanites? Um, nano biology, nano biological things that repair you. Essentially, turning someone into the Borg. <laughs> um, nanotechnology, you know, nanotechnological stuff that's heals your body. So the guy can't die, but the doctor keeps killing him and seeing uh, the guy get better, and he's. You know, when he leaks expense, it kills him again. <laughs> um, it's kind of, kind of good. It's it's good and suspenseful. It's good horror. Not necessarily scary, scary. Um, but it, it's it's good stuff. Anyway, um, I think that's it. That's the overreacher. There is a lot of big bugs and out there, and there's a lot of techno horror. Um, what do I say 153 to 192. War of the Worlds is techno horror as well. The King, uh, the Thing, not the King, um, which isn't a, a man going too far. 
Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Amityville. That's, well, 153. Let's go back to that. I don't think that the index was made properly in this version. Body Snatcher Invasion of the Body Snatchers House of Horrors the Black Museum Hmm Oh, well, Eco Disaster as well um, The Eco Disaster Prophecy uh, Pollution it's not man going overreaching, but it's subject to man doing stuff he's not supposed to be doing. Comes back to bite man in the ass. Um, pollution causes monster fish and monster things going on in that area. Um, phase four, some radiation causes ants to become super intelligent. Do, 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 do. Yeah, this is this this index is not good. Oh, here we go. Colossus. Um, Gog, which I talked about. Prophecy, which I talked about. The horror at Party Beach, where dumping um, nuclear waste in the ocean causes a monster to rise out of it and start killing teenagers. Um... Oh, 2001 would also fit in that category. Being that man shouldn't be trusting too much in technology. Big bugs. Um, the Andronis strain. Night of the Living Dead would be a techno, techno horror. Um, in that man shouldn't be sending stuff out, or man needs to be careful about sending stuff out into space. Um, Technological technology is the cause of the zombie uprising in Night of the Living Dead. Or it's implied that much, anyway. Not necessarily overreacher in the same sense as mad scientist -y overreachers of, you know, Faust, Frankenstein, Dr. Jekyll, Fritz Lang's Metropolis, um, Donovan, Don, um, Donovan's Brains scientist, Herbert West. But it's that sort of thing. Of course, going through the generations, the concept is going to change. Even Faust, if you had, a, if I did one of these for Faust alone, there's been, if you look up Faust in Wikipedia, and I recommend you do that, there's been about 15 operas on Faust. There's been about half a dozen, probably a dozen ballets. There's been dozens of stories, dozens of TV shows, pilots, um, uh, dozens of TV show episodes, rather, um, etc., etc., etc. There's just so many Faust things. And, of course, from generation to generation, the concept changes slightly. The difference between Faust Buch, the first one, and Goethe's Faust, or even Marlowe and Goethe's Faust, there are Two, over 200 years apart, 1604 and 1808, as you can see here. Um, quite a bit of difference between those two. And then, of course, you, it switches around, and you have these technologically things. Frankenstein and Jekyll and Hyde. So 
of the ovary chart. And then coming into, you know, um, a man with the x-ray eyes. The Faustian element is there. Um, or the overreacher element is there. Even Stefford wives. It doesn't come back to bite the men. <laughs> it comes back to bite the women. Um, the men don't seem to mind. Creepy, but whatever. Okay, folks. Um, I think I'm planning on doing one more. I might think of something awesome that I say, hey, I want to do this instead, or as well. But I'm planning on doing one more history of horror on the history of directors because I made a point several times that man, ev all these influential blah, 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 blah. all these influential directors either started in horror movies or did a lot of horror movies first uh, early in their career or throughout their career. Um, So I want to do a horror movie director thing. And then we'll be going on to horror anthropology, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I only have, I think, f three or four videos planned for that. When I started, I was only planning on doing one, but now it's it's blossomed quite a bit and I'm sure I'm just hoping someone else will take over on it because this is something I'm really interested in but I don't have the anthropology chops to really pull it off all that well but that's gonna be coming up really soon too uh, what I do the chops I do have I'll certainly put into it as much as possible so good night folks thanks for watching horror analysis have a great night you'd get really not great paper. And you'd print cheap stuff on it, like like Conan the Barbarian, or Conan the Sumerian, I keep, yeah. Conan the Sumerian, who's uh, Robert E. Howard, or Robert E. Howard's horror mo uh, stories, or Robert E. Howard's buddy, H.P. Lovecraft, published in Weird Tales, A Pulp. Um, You know, and of course, this is where horror comics start as well. At the, you know, not also um, shooting for the kid audience, also quite inexpensive. Um, the old school horror comics, um, essentially on almost newsprint. Um, in the same way that Archie comics are made. You know, it's not the most expensive paper. It's not fancy. Um, and of course, horror comics, as we talked about, got shot down in the mid-50s. Um, actually, I don't think... I think my, my lines are wrong on that a little bit, but that's okay. I can't make them perfect. Um, but that's all right. Um... And then, of course, paperbacks became in there. Your, your standard mass market paperback, such as this Feast of Fear, Stephen King. I have the mass market of Dance Macabre someplace. Here it is. Your cheap, cheaply made, selling for six bucks nowadays, mid 19th century. So the mid eighteen uh, fifties, and they sort of phased into the Penny Dreadfuls. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Penny Dreadfuls. Um, they sort of, well, as I said, they cost a penny, and they're full of dread. Um, yeah. And there's also the half penny terrors and stuff like that. Dime um, in America, dime terrors or um, ten cent terrors. 
something along those lines, um, dime novels. Um, really cheap to make, really sold cheaply, sold to mostly young people, because most of the horror audience is young, always has been, probably always will be. Um, but, you know, the early cheap books and um, actually it was called Yellowback Paper. Um, which makes me think of the Yellow Pages, which of course are cheaply made. Um, Petty Dreadfuls would be about that sort of thing. Really cheaply made. Of course, the next one coming along is The Pulps. Um, the Pulps were made out of wood pulp. It was the cheapest leftover wood from other, you know, when they're baking paper, the leftovers was pulp. Um, think of an orange. If you squeeze an orange, what you have left over is pulp. If you made paper out of that, not orange pulp, but pulp from wood products, he's an overreacher, and he's usually the first overreacher, so the first Faust book was done in 1587, and that was done as a chapbook. And chapbooks went further back than that, even. Um, we're talking about the 16th century here. Um, and Dr. Faustus was probably a bit more... Well, that was a, more of a broadside, because it was... Uh, because it was a play. But... Let's let's put up here my my work. <laughs> this is it's sort of am I know it's amateurish, but this is what I was playing around with chap books. Um, so before the 1800s, the cheapest thing you could get was the chap book. Um, really cheap printing. You know, not huge book, but cheap to make and cheap to sell. Usually only a half penny or a penny um, in the old British version. And of course, you know, I have it the, this is the maroon color. I have at the top literary magazines, which are going to be coming in to, to being pretty quickly here too. Those are where the big shots are going to be publishing for the most part. Um, up until the 50s, a little after the 50s. Um, so that's then the light, the lighter red. Um, but the rest of these are the cheapest possible things, and usually where where you'll find horror. So you have chapbooks ending in about the 18, well, until the mid. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Welcome back, welcome back to Horror Analysis with me, Drew. Whew, still hot. Alright, um, today we're going to go over... Well, today we're still in History of Horror. We're still finishing up History of Horror. We've gone all the way backward to the beginning of human history, and now we're going forward... We did a general review forward, and now we're going over certain topics I want to talk about going forward. Um, last time we did the, from beginning to current vampires. This time I'm going to do from beginning to current overreacher plot, being uh, the overreacher plot um, as described by Noel Carroll and um, philosophy of Horror, which I don't think I have in front of me at the moment. Oh, well. We know what we're talking about. Guy messes... When man messes with stuff he shouldn't be messing with, you have the overreacher plot. Hmm. I have my bottle of cold iced tea. Oh. <sighs> 
and I'm almost ready to go. Oh, and the other thing I'm going to be talking about today is the thing I'm going to be talking about first is the publishing history um, from beginning to current. Um, horror fiction, when it is published, and it took a while for it to be published, was rarely published except in the most inexpensive way possible. Just like horror movies in the 50s, the horror Z pictures and the B pictures, they just wanted to throw some money that they knew would be profitable. And if you think about the most profitable movies of all time, I'm talking here about horror movies. Paranormal Activity was made for nothing and made billions of dollars. Um, Blair Witch Project made with no money and made billions of dollars. Profitable stuff, horror. And usually it's printed on really, really, really cheap paper or in nowadays ebooks um, and makes a lot of people money. Not always the author. author. Not often the author. But makes other people lots of money. Um, yeah, so I actually made some arts, arts and crafts for publishing history. Um, I did. I made up a little uh, chronology um, because as soon as cheap publication became available and wanting to make profits, um, they're actually called chapbooks. Um, which is sort of the getting our word cheap from. So we're going back a little bit. The word meaning of the words changed a bit. But chat books, they were started way, way back. Um, well, the first Faust book. Um, the first, we're going to be talking about Faust and the Overreacher, of course, because um, 